this is the next video for this week. And we're doing chapter 13, Paleo Paleozoic Life History, Vertebrates and Plants. Previous chapter, we talked about invertebrates during the Paleozoic, 542 to 245 million years ago. Now we're getting into a more interesting topic, which is vertebrates. So let's go ahead and do that, and plants as well. Okay, first thing we're going to talk about is fish, because fish are the first vertebrates to appear in geologic history. And they appeared during the Cambrian period, the first period of the Paleozoic. The Cambrian period. First fish were very primitive, like this one you see here. This one you can see doesn't have any eyes. It doesn't even have a, a mouth yet. It simply sucked water through one side and it excreted it through the other side. These were very primitive fish. Most people think that um, that echinoderms, phylum echinodermata, may have evolved to form the first vertebrates. Why do people think that? It's because of the arrangement of cells in the embryo. It's very similar. And so some people think that the echinoderms were the ancestors of the first vertebrates. This shows you some bony armor and on the outside of fish. Nowadays, if you catch a fish or if you see a fish, then it has flesh on the outside and bones on the inside. Well, the earliest fish had bones on the outside, like a knight in armor, and the soft flesh in between. So they were bone they had bone bony armor on the outside. I'm gonna show you what they look like. In order to talk about the evolution of fish, we need to talk about the six kinds of fish. And you need to know these. The first is the ostracoderms, then the acanthodians. And then the placoderms showed up. So first the astracoderms showed up in the Cambrian, then the acanthodians, then the placoderms came next. These three types of fish, are, as you can see, are all extinct. They did not make it into the Mesozoic era. There is no astracoderms, or acanthodians, or placoderms alive today. They had bone on the outside of their body, and I'm going to show you what they look like. We also have lobe fin fish, cartilaginous fish, and ray fin fish. And all three of these types of fish exist today. The ray fin fish and the lobe fin fish sometimes are called the bony fish because they have bones inside their body. Cartilaginous fish, things like sharks and rays and skates, don't have bones. They have cartilage, and we call them the cartilaginous fish. Almost every fish that we see alive today are ray fin fish. And that includes every fish you've ever seen, probably. Um, trout, bass, walleye flounder, salmon, whitefish, catfish, bluegills, tuna. This is the dominant fish type on the planet today, the ray fin fish. Low fin fish are kind of rare, and we, we actually thought these were extinct until the 1920s when somebody found some of them still alive. Cartilaginous fish are also quite common. They include sharks, rays, and skates, and we'll take a look at those later. First, let's focus on the three ancient forms of fish that only existed during the Paleozoic era. The first fish to appear in the rock record are the ostracoderms. Let's take a look and see what they look like. Okay, the astracoderms are the first fish to appear 
and the the fish are the first vertebrates to appear in the rock record. First appeared the fish, then later on the amphibians, then the reptiles, then the mammals, then the dinosaurs, and the last vertebrates to appear would be the birds. Let's take a look at these strachoderms for a moment. This picture here shows you some different astrachoderm fish, and they, they look nothing like the fish we have today. Notice all of the bone they have on the outside of their body. Look at all the bone. This is all out, bone on the outside of their body. They also have paddle-like arms. Some of them didn't even have paddle-like arms. They had to just like wiggle on the bottom of the ocean. Also notice that the eyes are just little holes on the top of their head. And scientists believe that these fish lived on the bottom of the ocean and filtered the sediment to get food out, just like catfish do today, only they didn't have whiskers. They would suck in the sediment and remove any organic matter, and that's how they would survive. The fact that they had bone on their body meant they couldn't swim very well in the water. They had to live on the bottom of the ocean. They're too heavy. And that's why their eyes are on the top of their head, so that they can see any predators from that coming at them from above. These are the astrachoderms, and these are the earliest fish to appear in the rock record. Here's another astrachoderm with its bone on the outside of its body and the eyes on the top of its head. Next fish to appear in geologic history are the Acanthodians. Acanthodians. Let's take a look at the Acanthodian fish. Here you can see some different Acanthodian fish. And these fish had bone only around the head. So they had bone around the head. And these are the first fish to develop jaws for chewing food. Notice that many of them had two dorsal fins, or sometimes numerous fins on the bottom, pectoral fins, and their dorsal fins were their tail fins were long on the top and short on the bottom like this. These are the first fish that could chew food, giving it a big advantage because it, 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 once you chew food, it's easier to digest food. And since they had less bone, they only had bone on the outside of their head, they could swim. They were nectonic. These are called acanthodians. And they're the second type of fish to appear in Earth history, Acanthodians. Next one we're going to look at are the Placoderms. The Placoderms. The Placoderms showed up third. And these were enormous monster fish with bone around their head, like you can see here, and razor sharp teeth. These were monster-like big fish. Some of them grow 15, 20, 30 feet long with bone on here. They're different than the Acanthodians we looked at because the Acanthodians were much smaller and some people call the Acanthodian spiny fish because they have got all of these spiny fins. Now let's go back to the placoderms again. And these are the largest fish that lived in the oceans of the Paleozoic era. Very muscular bodies. You can see the, these 
they have these two front teeth that are sharp and four on the bottom. Just to give you an idea how big these things are, there's a human being compared to a placoderm fish. Sharks did not rule the waters during the Paleozoic era. It was the placoderms, these enormous, large, fierce fish. In fact, you can see here that sharks were dinner for the placoderms. They were tiny compared to a placoderm fish. It's important to remember that all three lines of fish here with bone on the outside of their body, astracoderms, acanthodiums, and placoderms, are extinct. Stracoderms went extinct at the end of the Devonian. We talked about that earlier on. At the end of the Devonian, there was a global cooling that wiped out most of the reefs. They also wiped out the astracoderms. We also talked about the Permian extinction 245 million years ago. Not only did it wipe out trilobites and blastoids and numerous brachiopod species and echinoderm, many echinoderms were wiped out. Uh, also, the acanthodians, the placoderms, became extinct 245 million years ago. So let's once again uh, take a look. So, you, so on the test, you'll remember you got the astracoderms on the bottom with the eyes on top of their head and these paddle-like arms. The acanthodians uh, with all these f spiny uh, sp um, fins on the bottom and on the top and just bone around its head. And then you had, and they're the first fish to develop jaws for chewing. Then you have your placoderms, the monsters of the Paleozoic. Bone on the outside of their body, razor sharp teeth. And here's your ray fin fish. They're the survivors that would dominate the oceans till to t until today, in fact. How did jaws develop? We think that jaws developed in acanthodians from the first two gill arches in the astracoderms. There was a genetic mutation and these became jaws and these were passed on because they were an advantage. Acanthodians, the first fish with jaws. So acanthodian fish, large spines uh, um, and um, they became extinct in the Permian. Here you can see Dunkleosis, a large placoderm. Look at those uh, sharp two teeth here on the bottom and four on the bottom. Four, two on the top, four on the bottom, bony armor around its head, muscular body. There's a shark. Look how small that is in comparison. And here's a placoderm. That is not as big, but it's still got bone around its head. And it could be a carnivore to many small fish. Another placoderm from China. They didn't make it till today. Sharks, rays, and skates are cartilaginous fish. They also eat, appeared during the Paleozoic era and survive on till today. Bony fish. There's two kinds of bony fish. There's the ray fin fish and the low fin, lobe fin fish. The ray fin fish are almost every fish that you've ever seen in your life. They have a tail fin. These are pectoral fins. These are dorsal fins. And notice that the they have bones that fan out like a ray, like a rays. And these are bones that fan out like rays. That's why we call them ray fin fish. Lobe fin fish we thought were extinct until the 1920s when we found some of these. And the interesting thing about some of these lobe fin fish is that in lakes in Africa, 
we find that these have they have hand bones going into their hand bones going into their fins. What in God's name is that for? Well, what happens is when the lakes dry up in Africa, they can hold their breath for maybe half an hour or more and w walk to another lake. It's a survival mechanism. And lobe fin fish, so they ha actually have hands. You can see the finger bones here in their fins. They can walk when they need to. Those are called lobe fin fish. Sharks, you already know what sharks look like. Let's take a look at rays. Not the baseball team. Rays look like this. And skates. This is the difference between skays and rays, but they're both cartilaginous fish. They sort of flap to swim, and they have this, rays have the tail spike, like the, the one the crocodile hunter unfortunately got killed by. This one doesn't have a, a tail spike. The skates don't. So what it is the first vertebrate to appear in the rock record. It is the fish. And the second vertebrates to appear in the rock record are who? The amphibians. So how did the first fish evolve? How did, how did uh, the amphibians evolve from the fish? First of all, what are amphibians? Well, you know amphibians as salamanders newts, frogs, toads. These are creatures that are tied to the water, but they're different than fish because they don't use gills to breathe. They have lungs, so they can live on the land, but they have to live close to the water because they lay their eggs in the water. Also, they have to live close to water because um, their skin has to be kept moist. That's why you'll never find amphibians in the desert. It's too dry, they would die. So the first vertebrates to appear in geologic history with lungs that could live on the land are the amphibians, but they're still tied to the water. And we think that the amphibians evolved from the lobe fin fish. Lobe fin fish, you might recall, have hands. Well, over time, some of these lobe fin fish developed much stronger arms and legs, and they became the first amphibians. What's the evidence for that? Well, take a look here, and you can see Labryithodont which is an amphibian, an early amphibian. And now we're going to take a look at a lobe fin fish over here. They have very similar skeletons, don't they? Don't they? The Labryithidon just has fully developed legs, but the skeleton is basically the same, and so is the skull, sh the shape of the skull. Therefore, most scientists think that the first amphibians like Labyrinthodont, evolved from the lobe fin fish. More evidence. Look at the legs of a Labyrinthodont, which is an amphibian, versus lobe fin fish. They have the same bones. The ulna, the radius, and the humerus. H, radius, um, the, the radius bone is here, uh, ulna bone is here in both. The humerus bone is here in both. They must have been related. We think that this is pretty strong evidence, once again, that the amphibians 
evolved from the lobe fin fish. Also, look at the te teeth are very, very diagnostic. Uh, you can identify a person even if only teeth are left because everybody's teeth are, is so individual. But uh, human teeth and monkey teeth and ape teeth and, and um, reptile teeth are all different. And you could take a look here and see that the tooth structure, this is the pulp and this is the enamel. The act, and you can see it's the same, basically the same when you look at the lobe fin fish and the earliest amphibians. More evidence that the first amphibians must have evolved from lobe fin fish. Also, uh, it's important to also note that the amphibians have to live near water to lay their eggs. Have you ever seen uh, how amphibians reproduce? They do use sexual reproduction, but it's a different form of sexual reproduction compared to humans and mammals. We, we do internal fertilization, where the male must insert his organ into the female and release sperm, and that um, fertilizes an egg, and then the egg is kept within the woman's or in the female's uterus until the baby is ready to be, uh, to, to, to be born. That's called internal fertilization. But amphibians do external fertilization. Have you ever seen um, after it rains and you look in those puddles and you see all these uh, frog eggs in there? Well, the fe when it rains, the females will lay their eggs in these puddles. And the males s can sense the change in water chemistry and automatically, by in instinct, release their sperm. And then these little gelatinous glob eggs, they're like little gelatin-like globs, the embryo will grow in there, not within the mother, but in the water. And that's called external fertilization. The amphibians would dominate the land. Some of these quite large, 10, 15 feet long, razor sharp teeth. They weren't runners. They were slow creatures, that ponderous creatures, but they were the first big vertebrates to invade the land. I'm always looking for fossils of these and because we do find them in Tennessee, of these large amphibians. Here you can see one in a Pennsylvanian forest, which this will eventually become coal. And this large reptile is called Eriops, sometimes 10, 15 feet long. Next comes the reptiles. And the reptiles, so first we have the fish, then the amphibians, then the reptiles. The reptiles are the first vertebrate to develop the amniot egg. What is the amniot egg? Well, we also grew, grew up in an amniotic egg too. But this shows you the first amniotic eggs were from the reptiles. The reptiles have a shell and then there's what we call the chorion you ever open up a chicken egg and you see that little peel on the outs on the inside of the eggshell? That's called the amnion, which surrounds the chorion. I'm sorry, it's called the chorion that surrounds the amniotic, amniotic cavity. In the amniotic cavity grows the embryo, and you have a yolk sac. You can see that that's what we eat that when we eat chicken eggs. 
but that we find those for reptiles too. It's a food source for the embryo living in the amniotic cavity. And th then we have a waste sac called the allantois. So this is the basic structure of an amniotic egg. The first vertebrates to develop an amniotic egg are the reptiles. And the big advantage of having an amniotic egg comparing a gelatinous egg that the amphibians had is it keeps the moisture in. So you don't have to lay your eggs in water anymore. And the reptiles had this huge advantage. They could live in dry climates and they even invaded the deserts. The moisture is kept inside. Reptiles, dinosaurs, mammals, and birds all have amniotic eggs. When you were in your mother's womb, you didn't feed on a yolk sac, but you fed on a, what we call a placenta. And we also had a waste sac. We don't have shell, but we had um, um, this, uh, amnio this uh, covering on the outside to protect the amniotic cavity. Um, placenta. So we instead for mammals like humans we have a placenta. Um, if you've ever given birth or seen anyone give birth you know what a placenta looks like. It looks like that. I was so stupid when my daughter was born uh, they finally allowed fathers to to watch the birth. Uh, prior to that, uh, fathers were not had to sit in the waiting room and then they'd have to walk back and forth nervously and wait until the nurse came in and told them that the, the baby's born. That's the way my son was born. The fathers weren't allowed in. But when my daughter was born, they finally let fathers in to watch the birth. And be, I was ignorant and, I, and, I, and the doctor uh, um, gave birth, you know, and he pulled this thing out, and I didn't know what a placenta was, and I said, I thought, oh my God, my baby's deformed, but that was just a placenta, that's really stupid, anyway, um, so the first reptiles to appear, appeared during the Mississippian, and there's two lines, this line here, called Thecondodians, you could you see these are bipedal Reptiles, bipedal meaning they walked on two legs. Thecondodians would eventually evolve into the dinosaurs in the Meso during later on during the Mesozoic era. Then we had another line that led to the Pelycosaurs, a common reptile that lived only in the Paleozoic, and then the Therapsids, who are the ancestors of the mammals. We'll take a look at Therapsids later on. First, let's t take a look at pelicosaurs. In Jurassic Park, you see these things, and people say, "Oh, those, they have them as dinosaurs." They're not. These are not dinosaurs. These are reptiles. Why? How do we know that they're not dinosaurs? Well, let's take a look at a dinosaur skull, which is called a diapsid skull. And dinosaurs have these two holes behind the eye socket. All dinosaurs have that. These pelicosaurs only had one. And so these are reptiles. They're not dinosaurs. They did have razor sharp teeth indicating they're predators and a large brain case. All carnivores have larger brains than herbivores. Meat-eating animals have to be intelligent to hunt. It takes intelligence to hunt. You have to plan your attack. You have to think about what happens after I kill my prey. How am I going to protect it? You might have to work with groups of your own species, individuals of your own species, and attack as a group. That requires intelligence. Herbivores, on the other hand, just have to chew leaves or grass. Uh, so they tend to be less intelligent. Think about it. Hence the sport of cow tipping. 
<laughs> That's not funny. Anyway, these pelicosaurs, what stands out in your mind's eye? How are you going to remember that these are the first, that these are reptiles from the Paleozoic? What stands out to you? Well, they're quadrupeds, meaning they walked on four legs. They were very huge. They were maybe 10, 20 feet long. But what really stands out is this fan on, the ba on their back. That's what a, the hallmark of a pelicosaur. There's bones and blood vessels going through this fan and the skin holding it all together. Scientists have speculated as to the purpose of these skin-like flaps. And there's three main hypotheses. Hypothesis number one is they oriented themselves towards the sun so when it got cold they could warm themselves. Reptiles are cold-blooded creatures, so they need to have uh, rely on sunlight to keep themselves, themselves warm. That's why you don't find reptiles in Antarctica and Greenland. There's not enough sunlight. But if they could orientate themselves toward the sun, they could heat themselves and survive when it got a bit cooler. That's hypothesis number one. What else do you think this fan could be used for? Well, think about uh, uh, two lizards on a rock, and they're trying to intimidate the other one to get off the rock. Well, sometimes what they do is um, some lizards will flash color into their skin, and that flash of color in their skin will scare off the other reptile. Could, maybe when one of these got angry, they flushed blood into the, these fans to scare off the other pelicosaur. Hypothesis number three is that these fans tend to be much larger for males than females. So, um, males have to do something to attract females uh, because reptiles do internal fertilization, which means that the male must mount the female, but he first must attract the female. And in the animal world, there's different ways of doing it. Car male cardinal cardinals would do it with a bright red coloration. Or what about peacocks? The males have they use this display to attract females and the the bigger your display is uh, and the more magnificent your display is the the more likely you are to attract a female so maybe the males use these fans to attract female you'd be like hey baby check out my big display he's got a little display and I've got a big display not funny sorry so you get really bad humor in this class for free. Anyway, so the um, therapsids would be the first mammals, and they evolved from reptiles. So first came the fish, then the amphibians, and the reptiles. And the very end of the Paleozoic, the first mammals appeared. And mammals are different than reptiles and that we're warm-blooded. We can maintain our body temperature. Therefore, we can invade the colder parts of the planet. There are many other things that, about mammals that make us different than reptiles, which we'll talk about in the next video.